It is good to be here, as Brandy said earlier. Get to see uh, some faces I don't get to see very often. And that's always nice. The Philippian jailer, in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, he said, what must I do to be saved? That is the most important question that can be asked by him or anybody else. What must I do to be saved? Because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And unless that sin is removed that separates us from God, we will spend all eternity separated from God. Suffering the horrors of hell in a place that is described as being a place of utter darkness. A place where the worm dieth not. A place where the suffering will just go on and on and on. What must I do to be saved? It's a good question. What must we do? Well, depending on who you ask, you can get a multitude of answers to that question. Some people might say, well, you don't have to do anything. If God chooses you to be saved, you're, you're one of the chosen. You're just saved. Others might say, well, all you have to do is just believe and invite Jesus into your heart. But there might be all sorts of different answers you might receive if you were to ask people that question. Some people might even tell you, well, you just need to have some water sprinkled on you, poured on you, and uh, later on, this is what they do with children anyway, infants, later on, you'll go through confirmation and you'll be saved. Which is the correct answer? Or are they all correct? Or can we just choose the one we like? You know, I was thinking about this and it kind of reminds you ever gone somewhere where they've had a, a fish bowl kind of thing and they have people's names in it or maybe even numbers, but they'll put out all those little pieces of the paper in a fish bowl and somebody will draw the number out or the name out. And whoever they draw out is the one that wins. Kind of reminds me of the same thing. They take all of these ideas, all these answers that they might give you, and they put them in a fish bowl. And you just draw out the one you want. And that's what you do, and you'll be saved. Well, it's not quite the way it works. Uh, and really, it doesn't make any sense for God to send His Son to this earth to be made in the likeness of a man, to live His life here, a perfect life, and to allow Himself to be arrested and tried and crucified and die on the cross that our sins can be forgiven. But it doesn't make any sense that God wouldn't tell us what He would have us to do. Amen. God has told us. Very clearly. He tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We hear His Word. We have the evidence. We come to a knowledge of the truth. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and we believe. And Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But also it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. So you put all those things together of what God has said, we are to hear, believe, Repent, confess, and be baptized. Those are the things that God says we must do. Now, I have been asked to speak on why we baptize for the remission of sins. Now, I can simply say it because I can simply say because that's what God says, and I can go sit down. <laughs> We're going to cover a little more than that, but that is what He says. You know, First Peter chapter three, verse twenty-one, for instance, it says, "Whereunto baptism doth also now save us." That's pretty clear. It really is. That's pretty clear. But let's consider the subject. Why do we baptize for the remission of sins? And I'd like to begin by answering the question, what is baptism? You know, if you look the word up in an English dictionary, you're liable to get the, uh, a definition like the following. 
the religious rite of sprinkling water on onto a person's forehead or of immersion in water. If you look that up in an English dictionary, that might be the definition you get. <clears throat> or you might get a similar uh, definition. Uh, they might say it's a religious rite in which either water is poured or sprinkled on an individual, or you might even be immersed. But, you know, when we're talking about what the Bible has to say, we're talking about the New Testament. You know, they, they, the English dictionaries that we might use, they are written, they give definitions of the way in which a word is used in its current time. And uh, the definitions we looked at a second ago may be how most people use that word. But when we're talking about the New Testament, we're talking about something that was written some 2,000 years ago in Greek. Therefore, we need to go back to see what it meant 2,000 years ago in the Greek language. What does the word baptism mean? Well, the Greek word, of course, that is translated baptism, that's actually transliterated baptism in our New Testaments, is the word baptizo. And the word baptizo means to dip, emerge, submerge, immerse according to Thayer's Greek-English lexicon. But it does not mean to pour or to sprinkle. If God had wanted, it to, uh, to, wanted to allow pouring or sprinkling, there are Greek words that mean to pour or to sprinkle. And he could have used all of them. He could have used baptizo and all those other words, words as well. But he did not do that. In every case, when he talks about this, it is baptizo, and it means to immerse. So when we look at the definition of the word, it means to immerse is what it means. But let's consider some examples in the New Testament of those who obeyed the gospel and what they did. In John chapter 3 and verse 23, John the Baptist, he was baptizing, it says in, in John 3, 23, he was baptizing, baptizing in Anon near Salem. Why? <coughs> because there was much water there. You know, if he could have sprinkled or poured, he could have probably done so with a five-gallon bucket of water. He could have baptized or sprinkled. <laughs> he could have sprinkled a whole lot of people with a five-gallon bucket of water. He could have even poured. You know, I don't know how many of you guys, anyway, uh, do much cooking. But, uh, you know, you could take a, a cup, a measuring cup, and you could have dipped it in that uh, five-gallon bucket of water and poured it on somebody. Well, you could do a whole lot of pouring with a five-gallon bucket of water. But uh, John was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. He was immersing. That's what the word means. And that's why he was where he was, because he was immersing people, baptizing them, not sprinkling or pouring water on them. In Acts chapter 8, verse 38, when Philip baptized the eunuch, it says that they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. But if a sprinkling or a pouring could have done the job, they wouldn't even have got out of the chariot. Now, I'm sure that the eunuch had some water there in that chariot. He was leaving, going from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, uh, and he probably had drinking water right there in the chair. He could have just taken that, poured a little water on, sprinkled a little water on. He could have gone right on his way. Wouldn't even have got out of the chair. But it says they both went down into the water. Philip, yeah, he was immersing the unit. He immersed the unit. He did not sprinkle him nor pour water on him. So we can see by the definition of the word itself, it means to immerse. We can see by examples such as these that what was done is that they were baptized. But what for? What is baptism for? You know, some people say it's an outward sign of an inward grace. You ever heard that? An outward sign of an inward grace. Some have said you, it is something you do out of obedience because you are saved. 
Well, you know, some of these same people who say these things, they practice immersion. But they deny that immersion is necessary for salvation. But what does God say? That's what's important, isn't it? What does God say? In Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In this verse, he, he says that belief is necessary. And that's where a lot of people want to stop. But that's not where Jesus stopped. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So to be saved... We have to believe and be baptized. We are not saved simply by believing and then we are baptized because we are saved. We are baptized. We must believe and be baptized to be saved. But a lot of people want to say that baptism is just something you do because you are already saved. That's not what Jesus says. He says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts 2 and verse 37, when Peter and the rest of the apostles stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached unto the people. And they proved to them, they showed to them, they reminded them how Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when their hearts were pricked, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, Peter didn't say, You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. Just believe. Neither did he tell them, you just need to believe and invite Jesus into your heart. He didn't say that, did he? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, when Ananias, who was sent by God to Saul to tell him what he needed to do, in Acts 22 and 16, when Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus, he said unto him, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins. Peter, as we referred to earlier, he makes it very clear. I don't see how you can get really any clearer than what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. What did you say, Peter? Baptism doth also now save us. Baptism alone? No. But it is part of what God requires. And when you keep in context of what Peter is talking about there in 1 Peter chapter 3, he's comparing baptism to the water of Noah's day. What did Noah do? built an ark, didn't he? And when it started to rain, what did that water do? It lifted that ark up. And it separated those that were in that ark from the sin of the world. What does baptism do? It separates us from our sin. Whereunto baptism doth also now save us. So, we know what baptism is. It's immersion. We know what it does. It saves us from our sin. It separates us from our sin. But does that mean that we are working our way to heaven or meriting our salvation? Because that's what some people accuse us of. And their proof text of that, what they'll probably go to anyway, is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where it says... For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, they would say that if you have to do anything to be saved, then you are no longer saved by grace. You are saved by works. Well, if that's the case, if we have to do anything, which is really what they say, if you have to do anything to be saved, then you're saved by works, you're not saved by grace. Then I guess Jesus was wrong. Because Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
I guess Peter was wrong. When he said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. You know, they want to say if you do anything to be saved, then you're no longer saved by grace. Well, if that's the case, then we don't even have to believe. Because Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 29, This is the work of God that ye believe on Him in whom He hath sent. What did He say? This is the work of God. What is the work of God? To believe in Him whom He hath sent. Therefore, what is belief? What is believing? It is a work. And if they want to say, oh, you can't, if you do anything... To be saved, it's required for you to do anything to be saved, then you're no longer saved by grace, you're saved by your works. Well, Jesus says, faith, believing, is a work. Therefore, we don't have to believe according to their thinking. We really don't. Ananias also was wrong in telling Saul to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sin. Well, let's examine their proof text. You know, they want to say Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says that we are saved by grace, not by works. You know, I do agree. I do agree. We are saved by the grace of God. We do not deserve it. None of us do. We cannot put God in our debt to where he owes us salvation. I do agree with that. We cannot earn our salvation. The price was paid by Christ. We cannot work our way into heaven. I totally agree with that. But really, when you take in context of what Paul is saying here in Ephesians chapter 2, he is talking about works of merit. He is saying here, uh, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, we cannot do works of merit that would result in our boasting in our own salvation. The Jews, they could keep the law. That was a work of merit. They, are saved, they were saved by grace through faith, not by the keeping of that old law. The Gentiles, you know, they could not boast that they were saved by some sort of work of merit. They too were saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by works of merit. There is no way we can put God in our debt to where He owes us salvation. But that does not negate the fact that we have to do works of obedience to do what God would have us to do to be saved by His grace. Let's consider some biblical examples of some works of obedience. You know, God saved Noah and his family, right? But they still had to build the ark, didn't they? Were they saved from that flood by the grace of God? Absolutely. But they still had to do works of obedience. By the grace of God, Naaman was cured of his leprosy. But he still had to dip seven times. Did he earn his being cleansed of his leprosy because he dipped himself seven times? No. It was still by the grace of God. But he had to do works of obedience for that to happen. You know, if he hadn't dipped himself seven times, and he was resistant to it, wasn't he? If he hadn't done so, he'd have stayed a leper. God parted the Red Sea, but the children of Israel had to cross over. <clears throat> Rahab and her family were spared when God had Israel destroyed Jericho. But they still had to stay in her home and they had to have that scarlet cord dangling out the window. 
Did they earn their salvation? Did they put God in, in their debt to save them? No. But it was a work of obedience. If they had not stayed in that house, they were told very clearly, if they were not in there when they attacked the city, they were going to die. It was a work of obedience. They had to do these things that God said to, to receive the blessing that God promised. We must do the same thing. We are saved by grace through faith. Not of works of merit. But that does not change the fact that we have to do works of obedience. We have to do what God has said to be saved. He said we must believe. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Even though Jesus says that belief is a work, we still have to do it. We have to confess. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. We must confess. It is something that we must do. But also, we must repent. Repent. And be baptized. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Repent, have a change of mind and a change of action. Something we have to do. Baptism, he, he didn't consider that. We must believe, we must confess, we must repent. We believe, we confess, we repent. But actually, baptism is the least of the things that we actually do. Because baptism is something that is done to us. It is not something we ourselves do. It is something done to us. We submit to it. But baptism is really the least of these things that he mentions here that we have to do. And we, we actually don't do it. It is done to us or for us. But yet that's the one thing that so many religious groups object to. And I really don't understand why, to tell you the truth. We are saved by grace through faith. Not of works of merit. But that does not change the fact that we have to do works and obedience. Let me put it this way, and I know it's an old argument, but it's still a good one. Have you ever seen the, the new Corvettes they have for the last two or three years? I'm not a big Corvette fan, but I think that is a nice looking car. I'd never be able to afford one in three lifetimes, but it's a nice looking car. But let's say that uh, I want to give you a 2021 Corvette. All you have to do is come over to my house and get it. It's only an hour and 20 minute drive. You can come get that, it's not a big deal. But yeah, I said, you can have that 2021 Corvette, just come over to my house and I'll give it to you. So you come over to my house and I give you the keys and you jump in it. Well, you're going to have to drive down the gravel road, so drive slow. I don't want to see the paint chipped up. But you're going to drive down that road in that 2021 Corvette. Did you earn it? Did you work for it? Did you have to merit it? Did you put me in your debt that I owed you that Corvette? No. But you still had to do what I <laughs> required of you to receive it. And really, it was by my grace that you received that car. Well, don't, don't get your hopes up high because you're not going to get it, but you understand the point. It is not a work of merit. It is a work of obedience. When God says we must be baptized, it is not a work of merit. It is a work of obedience, and it is something we must do. So we know what baptism is. It's immersion. We know what it does. It gives us a forgiveness or the remission of sins. It saves us, but also we know that it is not something that we do that puts God in our debt. So let's consider the proper subject for salvation. You know, John the Baptist, 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out to him. And he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He said, Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7. They may have come out, but they weren't fit recipients to be baptized. They really weren't. They needed to bring forth fruits meet for or uh, uh, fruits that were worthy of repentance before they were candidates for baptism. Just because they showed up didn't mean anything. Well, taking that same idea, <clears throat> infants are not proper subjects for baptism. Some religious groups baptize infants, and what they mean by baptism is they sprinkle or pour water on them. They baptize them because they say that infants have inherited sin from their parents. That is a false doctrine that is false to the core. Sin is not something that we inherit. Sin is something we do. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. To know it, to do good and do it not is sin, James 4, 17. Sin is not something we inherit. And this false teaching that has been around for a long time, it goes back to what is called Calvinism. <coughs> But this false teaching goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. They say that Adam and Eve sinned and therefore passed it on to their children, who passed it on to their children, who passed it on to us, way down the line. It is false to the core. The Bible never says that we inherit sin from our parents. Matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked, wicked shall be upon him. In other words, if my father sinned, I'm not going to be held responsible, accountable for his sin. If I sin, my father is not going to be held accountable or responsible for my sin. We do not inherit sin. We are held accountable for our own actions. Therefore, infants are not even a proper candidate for baptism. Because they have no sin. But there's some other criteria that they fall short of to be candidates as well. One must believe. You know, the eunuch, he was riding along in his chariot. Philip comes up to him, and the eunuch was reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip asked him, understand the Sabbath thou readest? The eunuch said, how can I? Unless man, some man should guide me. So he got up in the chariot with him, and he began to, to teach the eunuch about Christ. And he came to a certain point where there's some water and, and he, he understood that he needed to be baptized. And he said to Philip, he says, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? What did he say? If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. He needed to believe to be a candidate for baptism. If he didn't believe, what would be the point? He had to believe to be a candidate for baptism. You know, I've got some brilliant, absolutely brilliant grandchildren. They really are. They take after their grandpa. <coughs> well, more likely the grandma. But, uh, you know, when they were infants, they did not have the mental capacity to believe. But yet it is something that is required to be a candidate for baptism. But also one must confess. 
When the eunuch confessed Christ in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. He met another criteria. He confessed Christ. Paul said with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 10. If a person is going to be saved, they have to be able to believe and they have to also confess. Again, an infant cannot confess. So we see three reasons in all of this that an infant is not a candidate for baptism. One, they have no sin to be forgiven. They cannot believe and they cannot confess. Therefore, they're not even a, a candidate for baptism. So we've considered what baptism is. It's an immersion. What it's for. For the remission of sins and forgiveness of sins that we might be saved. It is not a work of merit. We do not put God in our debt when we are baptized. And we need to be a proper candidate to be baptized. But still, it is the greatest question that was ever asked. What must I do to be saved? You can ask a lot of people that question. And you might get umpteen. You know, I don't know how many. Where does umpteen fall in there? Is it, is it more than a thousand or under ten thousand? I don't know. But you can ask a lot of people that question. You're going to get umpteen answers. The only answer that really matters is what God says. And that is what God says. Baptism is necessary for the remission of sin. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Thank God that He loved us enough to send His Son to die that we can have that hope. If you're not, if you're here today, you've not been put Christ on baptism. I hope you'll seriously think about it. But you're talking about that which can secure your eternal life in heaven. And what a wonderful hope that is.